so we are still talking about exponents and roots, and we're now going to take a look at a couple of data sufficiency exponents and roots questions. It would probably be, again, a good idea to review our approach to data sufficiency questions. <clears throat> so when dealing with data sufficiency questions, always write down the answer choices, A, B, B, C, E for process elimination. Step two is then to find the info given. Step three is then to find the real info. And again, this is one of our important steps. Definitely want to find any real information that's there. Step four is to then find the question asked. Step five, also very important, find the real question. And then lastly, after all this, then we decode the statements. So, there's our approach to data sufficiency. Let's go ahead and take a look at our first example. So it says, question three, if, uh, if the value, or is the value of 3a over b a prime number? So we're asking ourselves, do we have any info given? We do not. Put our answer choices up there, A, D, B, C, E. We have no information given. Consequently, we can't have any real information other than the very immediate realization that, uh-oh, we're dealing with exponents. 3A and 3B are exponents. So we don't have any information given. Our real information is, okay, we're using, we're dealing with exponents. The question that is being asked, right, right here, is the value of 3a over 3b a prime number. But now we want to do some investigation to figure out what the real question is. Because if we understand that, assessing these statements will be much easier to do. So let's take a look here. We know we're dealing with exponents. We are dividing exponents. <clears throat> Thankfully, we have like bases already. So we know that we can work with these. One of the things we can do for the real question is to manipulate expressions that were given, algebraic expressions. And we know that the rule for dividing exponents is to subtract the powers. So we can rewrite this question here, 3a over 3b, as 3 to the a minus b. So they're asking us, is 3 to the a minus b prime? Right? Is that value prime? So we want to ask ourselves, well, what is prime? Prime means having only two factors, one and the number itself. So we want to ask ourselves, well, okay, how could this value be prime? Well, you know that if you are raising a number to a power, any a power other than itself, you're going to have more than one factor because you're multiplying the number by itself. So really, the only way this can be prime is if a minus b equals 1. So that's our real question. Does a minus b equal 1? And if we take a look at statement 1, we can now decode. a plus b equals 8. So, for example, a could be, a could be 5 and b could be 3, or a could be 3 and b could be 5. In either of these cases, there, could, there are many other possibilities also. But from this expression, there is no way for us to determine whether a minus b is equal to 1. Insufficient. Eliminate statement 1, meaning we can eliminate answer choices a and d, and move on to statement 2. Statement 2 says a minus b equals 2. Our question was, does a minus b equal 1? The answer, according to this, is no. It does not equal 1. That is a sufficient answer. Right? It is a definitive answer to the question. This was a yes or no question. This is a yes or no question. This is a yes or no question. We have a yes or no question, meaning we have a no answer. Sufficient. We can eliminate C and E and choose B. So that is one variation of a uh, exponent question dealing with data sufficiency. Again, very important to recognize that we're dealing with 
uh, exponents, then we're going to apply the rules for exponents. Let's take a look at another one. This one's a little bit more tricky. Uh, question four says, if integer n is greater than zero, is n to the one-half power also an integer? Again, running through our approach there, we want to start with our answer choices, a, b, b, c, e. Info given. Well, they tell us that integer n is greater than zero, so that's info given. And as a consequence, we know that we can rewrite that n is greater than zero. And it's also an integer. So we want to take note of that. An integer is not a decimal, not a fraction. We can then move on to our question asked. They're asking us, is n to the one half also an integer? So that is our question asked. But our real question, again, requires that we look at this a slightly different way. How can we look at n to the one half? Well, we know that fractional exponents can be expressed as roots. So n to the one half is the same as the square root of n. So we know that they're asking us, is the square root of n an integer? We also know something about square roots. We know that with square roots, the only way you're going to get an integer from a square root is if you have a perfect square there under the, under the radical. So we know that our real question is actually, is n a perfect square? Right, does n equal a perfect square? That is our real question. So we can now, after having done that work, again decode the statements. So statement one says 8n eight to, eight to the 1 half power is not an integer. Again, decoding statements means translating, manipulating, applying information you know uh, that is not given here in the question. So we again can use the same knowledge that we translated n to the 1 half with. We know that 8n to the 1 half power is the same as the square root of 8n. We know that with our radical rules, or root rules, we could write this as the square root of 8 times the square root of n. And they tell us this is not an integer. So we're asking ourselves, from this, can we determine whether n is a perfect square or not? And looking at this, we can't. Because we have the square root of 8 here, which is not a perfect square. And we have the square root of n here, which we don't know about. And the product of those two is not an integer. As a consequence, we can't determine whether n is a perfect square or not. Because the non-perfect square 8 could be the one that is causing us to not have an integer outcome. So as a consequence, we can't determine anything about n from this statement. We can eliminate statement 1, meaning we eliminate answer choices A and B, and we can then take a look at statement 2. Statement 2 says 9n to the 1 half is an integer. Again, manipulate this expression so we know that 9n can be to the 1 half is the same as the square root of 9n, which means we have the square root of 9 times the square root of n, which means we have 3 times the square root of n, and they tell us this is an integer. And the only way you're going to get an integer outcome here is if you have a perfect square there, so you can end up multiplying integer times integer. So as a consequence, we know that n must be a perfect square if we're going to get an integer outcome from this. So this is sufficient. The answer to our question is yes n is a perfect square, which means this is sufficient, which means we can eliminate B and, uh, C and E and choose B. So again, one of the keys to data sufficiency with exponents and roots with anything, finding the real information, finding the information, finding the real question, and then decoding the statements. You don't want to just eyeball this and not sufficient and sufficient. We don't want to eyeball this. We want to make sure that we are doing the work necessary to ensure that we know definitively an answer.
So that is exponents and roots, problem solving, and data sufficiency.